empaneled by CESOP. How many of us know the meaning of CESOP? Okay, good. There's something I know that you don't know. <laughs> CESOP stands for Southeast Society of Professionals, a group of young men and women from across the world who believe that, like Chino Achebe said, if you don't know where the rain started beating you, you wouldn't know where it stopped. And as a wise man, if you don't know what you're doing, they can carry you past your father's compound. We can no longer continue to complain about what is happening in our country without being the solution. So CESOP is a body seized with the responsibility for finding solutions to the things that we're dealing with. And that's why we've chosen to participate in this event. Now, the persons you're seeing here have been interacting online for, for a long time. But we've chosen to come physically today to be part of what you're doing. And without much ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist for this session, Dr. Ifediora Amobi, is executive director. Please clap, please clap. <laughs> executive director, Anambra Investment Promotion and Protection Agency, and SIPA. He was a former senior special assistant to President Goodluck Jonathan on national development. Next is, I prefer not to use the English one, even though I'm forced to speak English. Permit me to use Wada Adeline. <laughs> she's the very okay. She's the editor, BBC Ebo, media practitioner, start clapping, content production, writer, producer, and presenter. Next is Mazi Chineye Mba Uzoku. He had worked with the Microsoft West Africa. Oh, half one. Uh, there's what they call the big masquerade in Ibo land. Nukumau. I don't know what I even know. Uh huh. I don't know how far. Tell her that when I make mistake. Chineye Mba Uzuko. Chineye had worked with Microsoft in West Africa, but today is managing partner Grand Central. A round of applause for Chineye, my brother. Wow for wow for Ibo Amuzerike. Next is the former Minister Information and Communication of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Former Minister Special Duties, former DG Nigerian Economic Summit Group, and former, 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 former Mazi Frank Nweke, the second. <laughs> and like I said, I'm Obinaya Urapa. Now, do we have people who don't speak Igbo here? Please raise your hands and I will understand. Okay, please, may I seek your permission to do something cultural? Let me start like this Cha, 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 Igbo Kelen! Oh, no, no, you guys are following my hand. Ta 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 ta, Amala Kelewano. Riano. Nguano. Ban. Kezono. Okay, ta ta ta, Nigeria Kezono. Put your hands together for yourselves. <laughs> Excellent. Now, the, the, the starting of this discussion right away, let me ask a simple question. Obiasika does stuff in the media, and he does a lot of things very close to the movies. Let me ask you, how many of you have watched Black Panther? Excellent. Now, we were analyzing it this morning, and someone said they did everything to sound African in Black Panther. Now, how many of you would want to see Amala Keleno Nguono online in a movie being showcased on Broadway or in Hollywood? How many of you would want that to happen? Very good. So this afternoon, even you, <laughs> this afternoon, we're going to be discussing a topic that is very close to my heart, considerations on transitioning to a digital economy. What this tells me is that we are not yet at the level of the digital economy, and we need to transition. So I'd like to start with Dr. Ifediora Amobi. You have your microphone? Could you open this discussion for us? What's your understanding of digitization, innovation, and the whole talk about the digital economy, sir? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ifedio Ramobi, and I am thrilled to be here today. Thank you for accepting me. The digital economy, as far as 
we are concerned is actually the transition from a manual-based economy that we have known, the traditional economy, to a more web, internet-based uh, economic system that takes into consideration digitalization, working with um, web-based numbers that exist in areas that go far beyond what we are used to, that transgress into trade as an that go into payment systems, that go into, uh, you know, that just transform the way business is being done into a more futuristic way. And that's, uh, you know, what we are going to be confronted uh, with going forward. It is very, very innovative. And by innovation, which is one of the things you actually, you know, asked, is a new way of doing things, new methods. And so when we take the way things were, some of us grew up on a very, very manual system. Over time, transition. The world became more innovative. Businesses became more innovative. Ideas, ideologies, techniques, you know, transformed over time. And so, when we look at innovation and the new ways of doing things going forward in a digitalized economic or a digitalized ecosystem, it is doing things different than we are doing it today and the way it was done yesterday. So I know some of my colleagues have a bit more technical uh, ways of explaining digitalization. I am an economist and an investment expert, so I would look at it more on the financial aspect. And that's why I brought you payments and uh, the systems like that. Thank you. Excellent. I thought you knew what to do. Just encourage him for what he has done. Hand clap won't be a bad idea. <laughs> Excellent. Now, I don't know what you picked out, but someone said doing one thing over and over again, expecting a different result is the definition of madness. So it's important that we take what he said, that we need to do things differently. Wada, you work with the BBC, and you've been in the media world for a very long time. From the media perspective, what's your own understanding of digital transition? Uh, that's a huge question, because in handy of Sorry, what I just said, for those of us who don't understand is, a lot of people come to me and ask, okay, so you guys are saying these things and giving us lofty advice. How does it break down into everyday life and business? And one of the things that um, we have encouraged our southeastern people to do, because most of the stories uh, that we, we, we tell at the BBC Ebo is of people who are being innovative, who are taking, who are breaking boundaries, who are doing things not the usual way. One of the things that we encourage people to do is find a way that your business can interface with internet, with the internet, with information technology, with the use of technology. Why? Because we cannot say that we're Southeasterners and stay where we are. We cannot do business by ourselves alone. We must interface with people. We must interact with people. So it's important for us to understand how to use this technology to our benefit and how to ensure that our businesses, our farms, our whatever it is that Igbo people do can, be, can translate into money, can translate into business. I discuss with my team all the time and I said, I'm tired of hearing Nigeria, Igbo land has a lot of resources. Where are the resources? When I travel to the southeast, we have a lot of coal in Enugu, but I, I see our roads are very bad. Sometimes when we go to cover events or, ro or, or festivals, sometimes we have to, we spend almost three or four hours on the road, something that could take us almost 30 minutes. So how are we translating our resources and the things that we have into, you know, every day uh, onto, into the things that we need them to be how we translating that then that's where that's where we come in and say that um, it's time for our, our our brothers and sisters who are going into business to find a way find that technological space that your business fits into and key into it
Excellent. Excellent. I'm not surprised you're from the media world. Now I'm going to move over to the former minister, Frank Wenke II. But I'm going to be coming from the angles that you also wore several caps, or you still wear several caps. You've served as the DG of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. And just last week, the event happened in Abuja, and I was part of the discussions that took place in Transcorp. Now, a friend of mine just came back from China. And he showed me something on his phone, a train. And he snapped it. Now, the train was going at 302 kilometers per hour. Now, a discussion began to happen. On which road in Nigeria can you drive 120 kilometers per hour without knocking down a cow? I didn't say anything, no. I come to your cow. Or without having multiple checkpoints stop you. So we're dealing with a lot of issues right here. And Frank Wenke, having been in Enugu State Government with the governor, having worked with young people, having done things at the national level, having done things at the private sector level, what are the main issues you think we need to begin to deal with? Well, <coughs> well uh, greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. And Obina, I just want to say, I didn't know you were such a troublemaker. Honestly. I thought we were talking technology. I didn't come here to talk about cows. <laughs> Anyway, but you see, um, it's really great to be here, and I want to thank everyone who has spoken before me for the great insights that they've um, introduced into the matter on which Obina focused his uh, question. But you know, what you've just asked me um, has to do with the reality of the Nigerian situation. In order to be here today, I drove three and a half hours from Enugu. Three and a half hours. Complete nightmare. Complete and total nightmare. Because of the state of the road. And I do know that if that road or that road was in good condition, perhaps maximum two hours from Enuguto where you would have been here. And I recall visiting here some years back when uh, the late Simon Bakwe was governor, or even shortly after he stopped being governor. And I know that it was always a pleasure to want to come to Oweri because of the state of the road the sanitation within the city, and then even this old, uh, this Concord Hotel was a delight at the time. It was such a pleasure to be there. So I do understand what it means to have the right kind of infrastructure, and I know what it means for security. I know what it means for even, uh, you know, uh, your personal comfort. And so, but I must also say that because I've had to travel around the country from time to time, you know, by road, what you see, or what I, what, sorry, what we see in the southeast is not exactly peculiar. Um, a few months ago, I had to go to Ede in Oshun State, again to, uh, as guests at the uh, Adeleke University. And then going from Lagos to Ede was all of about six, seven hours because of the state of the road. So what I'm talking about today is not peculiar. So what does, it, what does that really mean? What it means is that, you see, it constrains business. It constrains the movement of goods and services. It almost undermines security. It just even undermines uh, development in any way you want to look at it. It also acts as a kind of pushback for investors who might want to come to the country. It undermines food security because it means that you cannot even transport food, products, and other things from where they are being produced to where you want them to be. And you ask me, what do I really think we need to do? And I want to say most respectfully that it has to do you know, with the quality of leadership. It has to do with the quality of public leadership. There's no one who can give who, what he does not have. And so someone wants to come to government, to be governor or to be senator or to be a member of the House of Reps. And then no person bothers to find out what this person's background is. No person bothers to interrogate this person and to say, okay, what exactly can we hold you accountable to, accountable for? I don't know if you saw in the news some months back where a governor of one of the northern states actually said in reacting to the pushback from uh, the citizens to say, listen, we're not going to elect you anymore. He said, what are you guys talking about? What, promise, what promises did I make? And in reality, he made no promise. And so the only thing he brought to the table was the fact that he was the son of a former military governor. That was brought, what brought him to, the, uh, to, the office, you know, uh, to that office. And you have so many people who are going to say the same thing to you. What exactly are we going to hold you accountable for? Nothing. So it's important that the right kind of people or people with the right temperament, people with the right vision, people with the right uh, exposure, 
and people who have the discipline to come to public office and for the populace to declare what they can be held accountable for. When the populace decides to accept a thousand naira for each vote they cast with one PVC card, then honestly, you lose the right, the moral authority, to actually demand that roads be built. You, dem you lose the right to demand that schools should be built and equipped. You lose the right to demand that investments must be made in ICT, investments must be made in uh, healthcare. You lose all those rights. And so, let me just use this opportunity to encourage all of us here, the young and the old, to please take your civic responsibility very seriously. Take it very seriously. Take it seriously. Our country is in trouble. Most of the states are in trouble. The Southeast is in trouble, as is Northern Nigeria. And all because we're not paying attention to the kinds of people that come out to seek public uh, office. We are not coming out to really hold even the people who are there accountable. We are not coming out to even participate because we believe it is for some kinds of people. And so, in a way, we are culpable, and our attitude, overall attitude, reinforces the kind of mediocrity we have in public, uh, in the public uh, uh, space. So, thank you very much for now. Thank you very much. Excellent. I didn't expect anything less. An old woman does not grow old in the dance. She knows how to dance. Frank Wenke has been in the public space for a long time. Another round of applause for him, please. Now, I'd like to just buttress the point by saying if people deserve the kind of leadership they get, and if we continue like this, we're going to keep getting the same type of leadership. Let me ask a simple question. How many of us have our PVCs? Okay. How many of us do not have our PVCs? Okay, now we know the people doing us. <laughs> it's not witches and wizards, we're the ones doing ourselves. <laughs> we forgive you. Straight on. Chinenye has had his life play out in the digital space. Permit me to use that expression. Chinenye was managing Microsoft within, in West Africa. Now, Chinenye, we're discussing digital economy. I'll ask you a direct question. What exactly is digital economy? And leveraging your experience in that space. This is OERA. This is Startup South. How do we begin to take it step one to step 100? How do we begin to practice digital economy? Simple. Um, <coughs> good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My, my I think, I think there are different uh, ways to describe this digital economy, but I, one way to look at it is to consider the way that, uh, the way that humanity itself has evolved, you know, um, and, and we're all familiar with the steps from the agrarian through to the industrial, the post-industrial, the information society, and today we talk about the about digital economy, um, the information economy, then the digital economy. Essentially, what it is is that it's a recognition that, that um, every single sphere of human activity is going to be impacted by digital technology. And therefore, capacity in that space, knowledge, capacity, and, and, and it, almost like an intentional approach in terms of policy towards leveraging digital tools, digital technologies, and digital systems is a critical part of any development effort. And I guess what that means in, in, uh, in, in, in simple terms, in even simpler terms, is this. Um, as a young child, I remember the telephone in my house. It used to sit on top of one, um, one chest of drawers in the, in the living room, and short of putting a burglary proof around it, you, nobody could touch it. So when telephone calls would come, you book the call a week in advance through PNT, right? And then you know you're going to get the call, you're going to get a dial tone at so and so time, maybe one o'clock in the afternoon. And everybody in the house is told that the dial tone is going to come at one o'clock in the afternoon. When you, when anybody hears that that phone go, heaven help you if you touch that phone, because the call is coming for your dad, and he's the only one who's allowed to, or your mom, the only person allowed to lift that thing up, because if you miss that call, you have to wait another week before you can get dial tone to call out. I know it sounds ridiculous to everybody in this hall, but anybody who has, I've seen some people with some gray hair. They must have experienced it as, as, as children, right? So think forward to today. 
this was like 30 years ago, 30, up to 30 years ago. In fact, up until 15 years ago, this was the reality for most of Nigeria. We should never ever forget this transition, and that's the best way to understand the digital economy, that we did a transition only 15 years ago. We did a transition from 400,000 telephone lines and 200,000 mobile phone lines to 120 million active GSM phones today. It is inconceivable. We broke a record as a country in that swing from um, analog telephony to mobile, driven by digital systems. In the same way, our country has gone from about four gigabytes of capacity, no, 40 gig of capacity for um, connectivity, 40 gig to something close to 13 terabytes of capacity. That's what has happened on the physical side, on the infrastructure side. But the digital economy that is built on top of those systems is what has not yet emerged. So to be a part of that, it means that every single day for this digitally native generation, because we learned how to use these things, but our children are born into access to telephones, access to the internet, access to laptops, and all sorts of things. They live their lives as digital natives. Whereas we are migrants, we came into it as the, as the system itself changed. So using that platform, that infrastructure, those technologies, that thinking, that way of life, the software that comes out of it, and converting that into economic activity is what is most critical. When we look at the Southeast and the South-South in general, we face a huge irony. So this bandwidth that we're referring to, this, this uh, 13 terabytes of bandwidth that we're referring to, it comes via submarine cable, and it runs along the coast, which means that it enters Nigeria, the, the broadband that you use on your phones today and via your dongles or whatever, is actually connected to pipes that are running along the coast. So the big question is, if the pipes are running along the coast, logically, everyone along that coastline should be the first beneficiaries of internet and, and digital technology. And therefore, we should have seen the emergence of a digital economy along the coast of Nigeria. And yet, we see a preponderance of this activity in Lagos. We do not see it in Otakot. We don't see it in Boni. We don't see it in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Calabar. We don't see it in, in Kwaibo. It's not in Uyo. And certainly, it is not further up inside the what they now call up country. So the challenge is understanding what needs to be done to make that happen. And we can fix the infrastructure. But like uh, Frank has said, the first place to fix is the mind. You have to have the right kind of people in leadership who really understand the implications. And it's very urgent. And I'll just drop two, two, um, two data points just before we move on. First of all, today, Lagos State Lagos State, in terms of um, internally generated revenue, the internally generated revenue of Lagos State is the equivalent of 30 other states put together. Say that again, please. So there are 36 states in Nigeria. Yeah. And one state, Lagos, has the internally generated revenue of 30 other states put together. So what that means and it's, it's going to change even more dramatically when Dangote's refinery comes up. It literally means that Lagos and the places around Lagos will control about 60 to 65 percent of Nigeria's gross domestic product if something doesn't change. The second point is that all the things that drive development in Nigeria today, there are three economies that are operational. There are states that are stagnant and even moving backwards. The economies in Nigeria that are stagnant or moving backwards, they are those that are transitioning, and then there are those that are accelerating. What it means is that over the next decade, we will see an even greater distance between those that are stagnating and moving backwards and those that are accelerating. And those in the middle that are transitioning are going to spend the next two or three decades and the next two or three generations attempting to play catch up. So we have to decide 
which one do we want? Where do we want to be? Are we the laggards? Are we transitioning? Are we going to be accelerating? Now, these statistics are not very encouraging. They're not very encouraging. The Eurobars will tell you that 20 children born the same year can never play together for 20 years. If we continue like this, we're likely to be among the laggards. But I'm going to take a risk by putting someone on the spot right away. Dr. Ifedioram Amobi. You serve as a, an active participant in a state, actually managing a, a state agency responsible for investment protection. Am I right? And you're from where? And promotion. He is in Anambra State. So the question I want to ask directly, is your state a laggard or is your state an actively upwardly mobile state? And if it's upwardly mobile, how can you be a model for the rest of the Southeast and the South out? Direct question. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, well, how many people here are from Anambra State? Okay. The reason why there are few people here is because the rest are working in Anambra State. Now, for those of you who knew Anambra State, say, 10 years ago, Anambra was what we regarded then as the Wild East. If you drove a car less than 30 kilometers per hour, if you're lucky, your tires will get stolen while you're still driving. If you're unlucky, you'll get kidnapped. Anambra was a place where nobody really wanted to go to. It was the only state where the convoy of the kingmakers will outrun or overrun the convoy of the governor on the streets of Anambra State. At the time, Anambra was what we regard to as a laggard state. But in the past 10 years, 10, 12 years, the Anambra came together, formed a group called League of Anambra Professionals, LAP, and charted a new 30 to 50 year course and agenda for Anambra State with a the theme, let's take back our state. And so we decided, it was a conscious decision by Anambra State professionals that the future of Anambra will not be in the hands of lunatics, in the hands of maniacs, in the hands of local terrorists, in the hands of money bags. And we decided to all come home. I used to work in Lagos. I used to work for the presidency. I was an advisor in the villa for five years. And I decided to leave Abuja. And we all came back as professionals back to the state. And we have put in quite a lot over the years, time, effort, sweat, tears, and blood, to ensure that today, after Lagos, and if you have to rank the top five states in every category and every indicator in Nigeria today, Anambra is ranked one of the top five. And we have worked tremendously hard to do that. And one of the things we did was take the Indian model. You know, in India, if you say to somebody that you work for the federal government in Delhi, they take pity on you. Because in the country called India today, the stars, the achievers, those ones have their hands or are involved at the world and local government level. It's those who cannot make it at the local government level get employed by the state. Those who can make it at the state level get employed at the region. And those who can make it at the regional level move to Delhi at the federal government. In Nigeria, it's the opposite. And so, the brightest of the brightest of the brightest of you, if we want Nigeria to develop, if you want your state to start moving forward, the brains, the intelligent ones, the graduates, you should start coming home. We are trying to make it fashionable in Anambra State 
or rather, we are trying to make it non-fashionable in Anambra State for graduates to now go to Lagos, or Abuja, Port Harcourt County, or even abroad to work. I know, I know in the past, when you graduate as a young man or woman, and you say to your parents, I want to find a job in the Newi, or Ekulobia, or Achala, your parents will conduct and consult your pastor to come and pray because their child is now possessed. We are reversing that. We are saying, bring the brains back home. In Kabun Kanye, Antra, Anambra, Buanibo, Ibuamaka. And so we, as the young ones, as the youth, are working hard to ensure that we retain our talent within the state. And we should do that for Eboi, for Enugu, for Abia and for Imo State. Let us start, start thinking home. You know, let's start think. You know, let's start bringing our talents back. And so, yes, investment and investors have started coming to Anambra State. We have been able to turn things around. The investment climate, the business environment is now conducive for businesses to now come, uh, you know, into Anambra State and survive in Anambra State. In the past four and a half years of the present government, we have generated over five billion US dollars in investment to the state. And we are doing more. We provide incentives. We encourage India Nambra who are outside first before foreign investment. A big chunk of our portfolio is domestic direct investing. Because you cannot convince Onyo Cha to come and invest if your own person and your own you know, brother, is investing outside the state. So the first line of marketing should be for Ndianambra, the Koscharism, and all these other guys who have big empires outside Anambra State to bring in at least 10% of their own investments back to the state. And that was how it started. Now we have the big Ndianambra people who are now bringing their own uh, funds and their own assets back to the state. And this is encouraging the likes of Innocent, who have always been on the Newi, to now say, yes, we can do it. Chikasin, all of them, you know, Ibeto, they're all there, they're all coming home, and they're all investing in, in the state. So Anambra today is not a laggard state. We are an actively, upwardly mobile, progressive state. And we shall continue doing that going forward. Thank you very much. Okay, my mother is from Anambra. Uh, my mom is from Monita. So for now, I'm from Anambra. But my father is from Abia State. <laughs> just joking. Who will say his mother's soup is not sweet? That's what Doc just did. But let's take this. Looking at the faces of the people seated here, majority of us are young people. So I'm going to take it back to their court. How do we digitalize processes, models, and work in their favor? How do they take advantage of being digital citizens rather than migrants? Now, someone said that the phone you have in your hands does not make you money. Throw it away. I don't know if it was Warren Buffet or was it um, Robert Kiyosaki. So I know you can make transfers on this phone. I know you can tweet on this phone. I know you can live stream on this phone. I know you can sell using this phone, talking about e-commerce, and you bypass all of the three and a half hours journey that the digital migrant, uh, Frank Wicke, is <laughs> past the show. So for those of us who are young, let's throw it out there. How do we begin to use digital innovation to survive the infrastructural challenges that are very much present with us? PPC, use your experience. So, um a very interesting question and we are also asking the question and even this BBC how can we make your business how can you translate what you believe in what you're, you're making money from to the phone one of the first things that I say to people is can we make ourselves more visible can people see you online Excellent. in a area here you're selling generators for instance People do need generators, and they want to know that they can receive generators at this price, at this time. There are already businesses that do that in the cities that are open. 
Mananalibo, people are traveling back this Christmas. What do you sell? How can they access you? Because they will need things when they are here. Can you do some kind of, you know, shopping for them? Christmas shop. Instead of buying things all the way from Lagos, we see vehicles loading every day. They don't sleep past days. And I'm like, we have industries in the southeast. People make these things in the southeast. So how can we key into the business of making ourselves more visible, our businesses more visible, and let people see that we can provide the services and goods? Let people see that our economy can move forward. How can you make money from, like what my brother said, your phone? So those are the things that we think, I think we can start doing. Let's start seeing how our businesses can connect. You belong to so many chat groups and all of that. How does it translate into money for you? It's not about taxing people on our phones, no. I have this business, I do this business. Can you, this is what I have to offer. Because there's always that need. And then once there's a need, people see that, I mean, there's always the, um, the businesses are created out of need. Yeah. So once your, your business is meeting somebody, somebody's need, they will contact you. If someone is coming home for, the, for a particular funeral and you're a caterer, how can they invest in your business? How can they take part in your business in the southeast and, you know, make sure that they, 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 they patronize you? I think these are the things that we need to start looking at. Excellent. A round of applause for her, please. Now, one thing that stood out in what she said is, is what I would normally say, that doing business and not advertising is like winking at a girl in the dark. Only you know what you're doing. No one else does. I've seen a lot of that. I see a lot of young people doing selfies and all whatnot, quarreling over Buhari and Atiku and so on. I believe strongly that there are more, more pressing existential issues at this level, and we can do well with, with our phones and the data that we have on it. Sir, you were in, in charge of information, and I also know I saw you on the network news on the streets of London. It had to do with the HITV, the DSTV, the multi-choice issues, taking the whole of Africa. Today, when you subscribe on the multi-choice, you see a special package specifically for Nigeria, not putting us in the same bouquet with the rest of Africa. I believe that was what you achieved during your tenure. Now, what have we benefited since then from what you achieved with that? Well, um, Obi, I don't, I'm not so sure I understand. Yes. <coughs> I'm not so sure that I uh, fully understand the dimension. Okay, I'm going to be very direct. HITV okay. began to operate after you visited London. I Something happened. Was it operational challenges? Was it infrastructure? Was it policy like China uh, said? Why did they go down? That's one. Next one, multi-choice is still increasing bouquets, and we have to do advocacy to get them to drop it. Now, young people need to get their businesses out, like she said. What have we benefited from what you achieved several years ago? Have we lost time, or have we made progress? Okay. Um, well, I, I, will, I would endeavor. It looks like there are people having another session behind us. Anyway. Um, it's ex is it me? Well, okay, so um, it's important to have a proper understanding of the background to what Obina just said. And so I was in government um, um, up to 2007. And so sometime in 2004, Ndukao uh, Biabwena, the publisher of this day uh, brought some information to our attention. And that information suggested that Nigeria was being discriminated against in the, uh, the bids or the bidding for um, the uh, broadcast rights for the English Premier League. Now, you know how much our uh, people love soccer. And so if you have uh, any satellite TV operation, or if you have any of those kind of broadcast businesses, and you didn't have such premium content like soccer, it meant that your business was literally going to go bust in any, just in a moment. And so when this was brought to our attention, we could not understand why Nigeria, with its population, and then, you know, it would be, you know, would be literally barred from participating in the, even the bids, just the bidding process for this uh, English Premier League uh, content. 
And so we made inquiries. And our inquiries revealed that it was not based on any logic. Okay? It was not based on any logic. And so when I studied that document that was given to, uh, to me by uh, Endosa, I sent it to the then uh, DG of the Broadcasting Commission. And I said to him, please review and advise. It's a very popular, you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> the way you, you know, you mean things. So I said, please review and advise. So he came back to me and said to me, oh, God, I don't mind them. Just leave these people. I said, no, I can read, I can write. This makes a lot of sense. If, I mean, the, 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 the effect of the monopoly that the South Africans enjoyed meant that they could charge whatever they wanted unchallenged. And so we thought that, listen, Nigeria was a huge is a huge market. We had the, at, at least as at that time, we had the largest number of even TV sets on the continent. And uh, our population, as at the time, was rated at about 175 million. And at that point, it was also estimated that we had about 44 million TV sets. Now, our closest competitor was South Africa, with a population of uh, just a little above 40 million. And the, and the TV set was estimated at about 25 million. And we said to them, listen, guys, any which way you look at it, without Nigeria, this Premier League thing is not, uh, is, not, uh, is not profitable for you. So we mobilized and went to London to engage the British government, to engage the English Premier League, the management of the English Premier League. And the idea was to try to find out if there was some other information not available to us, for which reason Nigerians were not allowed to participate in the bidding process. And uh, we found out that it wasn't based on any real reason. It was actually based on blackmail. Blackmail by South Africans at the time, suggesting that Nigerians didn't have the capacity to manage the, that kind of content and all sorts of things that were said. But we were well prepared. And on that delegation, we had Ben Bruce. We had, um, I think, Tony Radia. We also got the bankers in from UBA, from Echo Bank. We had John Momo of Channels TV. Just, you know, the brightest in that area. We, 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 you know, we moved out there. And then, of course, the people from the Broadcasting Commission, and then also from the Video Census Board. And we made a very strong case to say that, listen, we're not asking you to dash us content. All we're asking for as a nation was that we should be accorded the respect, basically even being allowed to bid. And if we failed in a, uh, through a transparent process, we didn't have a problem with it. And so uh, they thought it was a joke. Unknown to them, before we went there, I had even changed certain... Um, um, guidelines within the Broadcasting Commission to make it illegal for anyone to acquire content that for in which Niger uh, uh, content which Nigeria had not participated in bidding for to broadcast it in Nigeria it was going to be an offense and indeed that if we had a way to confiscate it we'll confiscate it and we're going to transmit it you know uh, give it for, uh, for free to everybody so when the after all the shenanigans you know they were sort of arrogant it's about their show shareholders and we were pushing that we had the population. We had the population in Nigeria. And uh, they thought it was a joke. And I said, well, you can keep satisfy your shareholders. You're not going to broadcast this in Nigeria if you don't allow us to even bid for it. And um, we would seek ways to keep our people entertained. And so we literally staged a walkout at the time. And uh, before, we got to the, before I got to the car, the British Minister of Sports was uh, on the line. Uh, asking for a private meeting. I said it wasn't part of my itinerary and I declined. But after much uh, pressure, we then agreed to meet. And we took him through the presentation that we, we shared with the, uh, with the uh, Premier League, uh, the management of the Premier League. And he said this made a lot of sense. We were not asking for some donation of content. We just said we wanted to bid. And so today the rest is uh, history. We were then allowed to bid and Nigeria won the bid. And we gave them something else. We said to them, listen, in order to make it even more profitable and to make sure that no nation or no group of people ha hold a monopoly over this, we said, break it into bouquets, into class A matches, class B and class C matches. And I said, for free, you're going to get even more money because you're bidding this, for these things. People are going to bid in silos. And that's why you see it's possible for, um, say, for DSTV can be broadcasting certain classes of um, matches and then uh, say NTA and AIT, they have their own and then other people around the continent have their own. That was the model they adopted. Now, why, you know, so we came home and everybody was so excited, you know, but we did what government was supposed to do, which is to defend her citizens, to defend her sovereign rights, to really open doors for the private sector. That is what responsible governments do around the world. And that was exactly what we did. Now, for the records, I have absolutely... I had none, and I still do not have any personal interest or stake in HITV. 
and I've been asked this question times because people believe that you cannot go to that extent if there is no personal interest. So I want to put for the re on the records that I have absolutely no personal interest. And I tell you, you asked a question, what happened eventually? What happened was that Tony Subai, the gentleman behind HITV, in, uh, with the support he got from GTB and the support he got from so many other people, I don't want to mention their names now, but I just think they have a right to privacy, he mismanaged the company. He mismanaged the company, mismanaged the funds of uh, shareholders, and eventually, he fell in breach of the agreement he had with the uh, English Premier League. And uh, it sort of proved what the South Africans uh, said, that Nigerians did not have the capacity to manage it. And so, again, they took it back. And today, multi-choice is back to having the monopoly that we broke uh, sometime in 2005 or thereabout. We broke that monopoly, but they're back to having it. And that is why they just raised the figures at will and just changed things. And so, uh, to the other aspect of your question, if I may, it's important that um, it's, imp it's important that young people acquire the necessary expertise required to manage businesses. So sometimes it's not so much like you don't have the support you require, or so much because you don't have the funding you require. GTB was behind this guy. GTB was behind this guy. This guy had the passion. But he did not have the personal discipline to actually stay the course and manage this business. He did not have the personal discipline to respect the uh, funding support he got from these financial institutions and from individuals. And so I just want to urge you that sometimes delayed gratification is probably the best bet for you. Do not uh, think that once uh, you land something big, then you have arrived. And therefore, you go to town, you change your shoes from black to green, and change it from green to red and to yellow, and you start dressing in some funny ways, and you begin to do, go to places you should not normally, or you begin to keep the company of people you should not normally keep, or begin to eat the things that are even unhealthy for you. You need to continue to have the personal discipline to grow the business, and to really stay the course, in order for you to remain successful. Otherwise, that success will be fleeting, as uh, is the case with HITV. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. I'm going to pick a few things from what he said, and I'm going to go straight to Chine. Our time is uh, almost um, up. We we'll have just about three minutes. So Chine, you're going to generally just take it from where he stopped, but he, he, he pointedly spoke about entrepreneurship. And CESOP is about entrepreneurship, having the critical competencies to be able to manage businesses. So can you just take us through what it takes to start, consolidate, and, and scale up a business? going by your own experience. Okay, so I, I guess I should speak in directly to this uh, generation. Um, that, that's why we're here, actually. For, for many of us, we believe that um, if we, we are kind of like done with our own part of um, the struggle, life is a journey. You get to a certain point and you've like, kind of like done what you need to do for yourself. The next thing you have to do is what are you going to do for the rest of the people who are around you. So almost everyone that is here today is actually here for exactly that purpose, how to, how to pass this forward, right, into your generation. So I, I would say a few things, and don't mind me if I sound a little bit condescending, um, or, you know, um, I think it's, it's, it's the, the road to success, right, the road to success, and this is absolutely important, is for people to understand themselves and their own capacity, their own capability. There's something you call aptitude, right? And aptitude is what comes to you naturally, the kind of things that you can do without thinking about it. But, you know, some people think they have aptitude for, you know, they have aptitude or talent for singing, and you wish they just wouldn't open their mouths. You know those ones in church, you know, when they are singing, they are singing loudest. And you're like saying, please, can you kind of like tone it down? There are people who, who having an aptitude is something that you feel is natural to you. But it must be confirmed by something else. If I think I'm a great footballer, my, the confirmation about my skill set isn't me saying I'm a great footballer or me being able to trap the ball. It's about me being able to trap the ball better than anybody else on the field. So your aptitude, your aptitude is, is critical, but it isn't what makes you successful. The next thing you want to do is to connect that your aptitude, right, with something that you have a passion for. So if you have an aptitude for football, but you don't really care about it, is that something you want to do every single day? You have an aptitude for music. You can play any instrument, but you don't want to put in the hours that are required for you because 
It's just because you don't have the passion. If you have a passion for something, you live it until you die. All right? People who are incredibly successful, I mean, some, many of you may have read about this 10,000 hour rule that, that made, was made popular by Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell. So when you look at people like Tiger Woods, Serena Williams, Michael Jackson, all these people, these people give their lives to whatever it is that they've decided they want to do. They live it, they steep it, they eat it, they drink it, they use it in a the bathroom, they, every single minute they're in it. If you're doing something for which you have aptitude, but you don't have the passion for it, the likelihood that you're going to succeed is going to be really small. And that takes us to the point of entrepreneurship. Having an idea doesn't make you an entrepreneur. Being able to write code doesn't make you an entrepreneur. You can be an absolutely great engineer, world class. You can be the best possible programmer in the entire world and never run a business for one day. The idea that any Tom, Dick, and Harry who wakes up and says, I have an idea about how um, it is like Uber and we can do it, you know, worry. And therefore, you consider it to be a business and you pursue it with all your life. I think you're just, um, maybe you should drink less than wine and focus more on trying to talk, listen to people, try to figure out what that you're really, really good at. Everybody who comes up with an idea doesn't need to be an entrepreneur. And I think it's a, it's a fallacy of this young generation that they, the current generation, because they're digitally native and all the examples are around them, there's a sense that I too will be a startup. So nobody wants to work for the next person. And yet there will be workers. If you want to be successful at it, you just tell there that you have an aptitude for it. We have a lot of startups, young people who come, they want to run businesses, right? They are financially illiterate. And what I mean by financially illiterate is that they do not understand the numbers that help them to run that business. And they're not even teaching them. And frankly, when you teach them, they hate mathematics. If you give them numbers, they just run away. They don't want to see numbers. They don't want to calculate forecast. They don't want to understand profit and loss. They just say, eh, I'll call somebody to do it. If you don't like numbers, the chances that you would ever be a successful businessman is near zero. It's closer to zero than anything else. So understanding that is, 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 is important. And I think what it all underscores is this. Unfortunately, and nobody, I, nobody would like for me to say it, but I have to say it. If you graduated in any Nigerian university after 1985, <laughs> well, you, I say it everywhere I go, and they, fortunately, nobody has told me yet, oh, over a please don't have one more, don't have one hour Lagos, because nobody should go and pick me up outside. If you graduated from Nigerian university after 1985, you are an endangered species. Because the fact of the matter is that our education system has been in reverse gear for at least four decades. And if you graduated after 1965, you are one of those who entered in when it was really, when the situation was getting even worse. So what I mean is this, do yourself a favor. Don't say I graduated with, from MassCom, from so so University, and therefore you are a graduate, and therefore certain things will happen. Now lie. It is most likely that your lecturer was a, was a third class graduate who couldn't get a job, went in and did PGD, ended up back in doing a master's because he couldn't, still couldn't get a job, entered the university system and became a doctor and eventually a professor. And apologies to the academics in the hall, but the truth has to be told. That's why your universities are in the state they are. And that's why NUC itself is saying that the graduates that are being produced by the universities, it has license, are unfit for work. So if you're in this hall, I'm asking you to please, for all our sakes, do an honest assessment of yourself and what you, where you currently stand. I'm not saying that they are not intelligent. I'm saying that they have been handed a dysfunctional education. The country has done you damage. You need to go back and go and fix it for yourself. So the more time you spend on Instagram and the less time you spend going through online courses to improve yourself and equip yourself, Excellent. you're doing yourself. In five years' time, I've told you, economies are accelerating. Yours is largely is. 30 states out of 36 is heading in this direction. And the bulk of Nigerians live in those 30 states. 
So you are an endangered species. You have to help yourself out of that position. And the best way to do that is by overcommitting to your own personal development through re-educating yourself and continuously educating yourself. I came on this trip. My suitcase is heavy. I have three books inside it. I never move an inch without a book to read. And most of the people that you see around you who are like that are reading constantly because we never know enough. You have to commit yourself to a lifelong learning process. And the energy for that has to come from you. Don't point at Nigeria. The energy has to come from you. <laughs> Don't point at Nigeria. Now, if you have your pen and paper, I'd like to call out a book. He mentioned Malcolm Gladwell, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be giving you Malcolm Gladwell. Please write down for me The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. There, you will see the 10,000 hours principle, and you will learn a few things. Everything you do acts up down the road one day. So whether you, you are reading now, it will show. Whether you are not reading, it will show. And the long and short of it is, please write down for me the 80-20 principle. Yes, sir. Vifredo Pareto. 20% of the things you do will, determine 80 per, will, will get you 80% of your productivity. 20% of your staff will cause 80% of the problems you have in your company. So the long and short of it is that we are not here to play. At your age, you're no longer supposed to be dancing for them to be spraying you, spray you money. You're too old. So I'm going to take the questions now. So I let our panelists run along. Um, we took a question from here, the last panel, and I saw somebody go here. So I'm going to be very fair to the people here. And I'm a little gender biased. So I need more ladies this time. I'm going to be taking to all the single ladies. All the single ladies. Where are the ladies now? It's more time now. And I'm going to talk to you with the marginalized owner. Where are the ladies in the house? Now she's wondering what's in the house. <laughs> Sorry, I'm for you. I promised you. <laughs> so where are the ladies? <laughs> See problem now. Okay, I'm going to take him. I saw your hand the first time, so I'm going to be very partial to you. Can I have a microphone for him? I'm still going to be waiting for the ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, please run along. One minute. Very short. Thank you very much. Yes, My sir. name is August Shuku, and uh, I just graduated last June. And uh, I'm very much keen on being an entrepreneur. And I have a lot of ideas that I want to put forward. I want to develop. But my greatest, uh, my greatest constraint, my greatest uh, challenge is the kind of environment I've found myself. I grew up in Oweri. I've not left Oweri since I was born. But through the books I've read, I've found out that there are a whole lot of opportunities outside the world. And as you struggle and struggle to make things happen, it seems like your, the environment you're in you know, is pulling you down and it's forcing you down. Now, I came up with a theory in my tiny brain that I called individually propelled growth. That the government has failed us for years. Let us stop hoping on the government. Let us start doing things for ourselves. You know, the, the kind of revolutions that we saw in, in water borehole, in uh, the digital uh, 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 satellite TV, and in communication systems, let us bring it in into the healthcare sector, the education sector, and let's make these things happen. But but the, the problem we have is, the greatest problem I think we have in this country is electricity. And since I came this morning, we were talking about a whole lot of things and the digital economy and how we should make it scale. But we do not have the, the primary requisite thing that made the 20th century economy, that is electricity, to boom. We don't have it in Nigeria. And how can we develop in the dark? We cannot develop in the dark. Now, the, the, the world is going uh, uh, green, uh, uh, green energy. Okay. Uh, yeah. The government is not making any conscious effort. Okay, leave I, the I don't think. No, leave the government. Companies you, hello, um, that, hello. That, that, that fund. Sorry to cut you. You already said the government has been failing you for years. Talk for yourself and you have 10 seconds to tie this up. Renewable energy, I just heard that from you. Tie it up in 10 seconds. Okay. In 10 seconds, I would like to say, how are the, investment, the investors, the, the, the VCs, working on helping companies, you know, that are interested in making power supply constant in Nigeria, solar companies and all of that, let them start manufacturing in Nigeria, 
Excellent. And let us make this. So this is venture capitalists, angel investors. Excellent. I got our question. Thank you very much. Okay, you're going to pardon me. I take from here. Okay, okay, okay. I, are you sure you've not asked the question? Please come. He has. If you have before, please note. Be fair to others. So I'll take the next person. Please come. And we're tying this up in a minute. Thank you, sir. Actually, you said that the your name, NUC... Your name? Okay, I'm Iwaya Precious by name. You said that the NUC said that um, graduates are unfit. So now, going by that, do you think that these guys have wasted a whole lot of years in the university and um, for them to come up with thoughts, which means that there is a gap between what is obtainable in the school and what is obtainable in the industry. So how then do you think that such gap can be filled? Thank you. Excellent. So we'll take the first one. I think we're done. I'm going to take the first one, Doctor, because of um, the investment part of what you said. And then, um, Tine, do you take the other one? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just quickly, uh, your question was, sorry, uh, yeah, on venture capitalists, how do investors, how will they invest in power, right, in electricity? Yeah, based to make electricity work, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> You know, in the past, electricity was, or investment in power was a federal, um, you know, thing. Now, investors can actually invest at the state and even at the local government level. The Power Sector Reform Act has now been implemented such that you don't have to invest in big, massive 2,000 megawatt power stations. You can do modular uh, power sector investments. You can even invest in one megawatt. You can invest in a captive area. In other words, you want to produce power that can only be captured within maybe a government secretariat, a university, or a small part of town. You can do that. It's just almost the equivalent, you know, to installing a larger generator. Okay? So, those type of investments are encouraged. And various states encourage investors to come in and they define a captive area where they want that power um, supplied to. So, yes, investment is. Huh? Okay, yeah. So, investment is actually encouraged in that sector. And that helps boost um, industrial activity, helps create jobs, helps increase productivity. Okay, so. You know, um, yes, yes. You know, your fears are actually allayed, yeah? and I will give my colleague um, Frank to explain further. Uh, did you say your name is Augustus? Okay, Augustus. I mean, I'm really very nice. I mean, I like your boldness. So thank you at least for speaking up. But I want to assure you that um, the darkness that you describe as a constraint is actually an opportunity right there. It's an opportunity. And you know, uh, over the last weekend, Friday and Saturday, we had a big event in Abuja called I Create, I Create Africa Skills Festival, where we were trying to um, encourage people to embrace certain skill sets, which people look down upon in society. But one of the segments of that uh, event was what we call the um, social impact uh, challenge. And we had young people come to pitch ideas that were in need of uh, support of any kind. And um, <coughs> One particular one caught my own attention, and I invited them to see me the following uh, Monday. Uh, a team from northern Nigeria, again concerned about the uh, poor electricity supply, had come up with what they call a mini-grid solution based on renewable energy. And they're already working in a community in northern Nigeria. And so when they finished, they said their problem was that they needed a million naira to be able to really expand what they were doing. And I was so fascinated, because these were young stars like yourself, and... Um, they came up with, um, you know, um, some very, very, very innovative uh, uh, tech, uh, some dashboard uh, with all the softwares and all the apps and things with which they could even monitor what they were doing in that community from their home. This was entirely their idea. And all they needed was a millionaire. So those are the kinds of people that the world is looking for today. As we speak, they have left for Cairo because they were part of uh, a competition which took them to the UK. 
And even though they didn't make it there, there were other investors that said, no, this idea needed to be fine-tuned. And so they've invited them to Cairo for, uh, for, for about two weeks. So Augustus, yes, government has failed. You're not selling us anything new. It's common knowledge. All right? I've been in government. I'm out of government. And I know that government can do a lot more. But leadership and followership is shared responsibility. So if government has failed you, are you going to fail yourself? So you have an opportunity to really make a name, make history, and solve a real problem, which is that of electricity supply. So maybe you can contemplate what I've just said a little more and see what more can be done. Thank you so much. And I, I'm, going to, I'm going to write on top of what Frank has said and just tell, tell two quick stories. One is of a, you know, I, I, I tend to cry a lot, you know, when, I'm, when I'm, I'm the emotional type, you know, so I kind of like, when they make me cry, my tears will start coming. So the last time I cried was, um, I, w I was sitting in a panel like this as a judge for a, a, a hackathon. And um, two girls stood up from Kano State. One was 16, the other one was 11. And they stood in front of the audience. The 11 year old made the presentation of their concept for a business that solves a very real problem in Kano, which is water. And she reeled out facts and figures and related the figures directly to what the problem was and told us how the solution that they were putting forward was going to solve that problem. And by the time she finished, I mean, she carried 80% of the presentation and her 16-year-old colleague carried the other 20%. By the time they finished, there was a standing ovation. And I was standing. I stood up first and I was crying. I couldn't believe that, you know, a, an 11-year-old was making this presentation. Now, what was the idea? They live in Kano, where 70% of the water, potable water, is delivered through these people who push barrows. We call them Garua. So their idea, right, and I, I want to speak some, a bit to what you said. Their idea was to create an Uber for Garua. What is Uber about? Uber connects people who need a ride with those who want to who want to give a ride as a fee, right? That's what it does. And as simple as that sounds, that's exactly what this girl said. That a Garua passing through here with water, who has sold only one out of his 10 uh, gallons, is passing here. And this man here needs water, but doesn't know that the Garua is passing by. If he can link this man to this Garua, then it means this Garua will sell his water, and this man will have his water. It's as simple as that. That concept, that idea, those two girls, as far as I know today, at least for what I saw from the people, the initial set of investors, they put 5 million naira into that business. It was taken up, it's been taken up by a global donor as a solution for Kano State, solving the water problem in Kano City. And the children are 11 and 16. I want to bring it to what you, because what Frank was saying, you, you know, what, what, I went, what I meant by education, I'll tell you another story of another group that are in Joss. Their own idea was Joss is hilly. There are too many, most of the people live in places where there are no roads, identifiable roads. So they came up with the idea that anyone who wants to make commerce, e-commerce possible, right, would need to deliver goods. How do you deliver goods? So they came up with an application. The application, when you want to order, instead of putting your address, you put in your GPS location. And your GPS location goes with your order. When the person, the merchant, is trying to deliver to you, it just clicks. Like you click now on a, on a location that you share in Google Map, right? And they click on it, they bring it straight to you. People are solving real problems in their own locality. When I talk about the failure of the education and the issue around this, your university degree, is that if you have a university degree that hasn't made you a critical thinker, a problem solver, how to identify a problem the way that these children did. And it leads you directly, think critically about it, carry out the research and formulate an answer and test that answer. Then your education has failed you. And believe me, as an employer, and many of my colleagues will tell you the same, we don't care. I don't care whether you have a university degree or not. It means absolutely nothing to me, particularly if your degree is from Nigeria. The only thing that matters to me is those five things. Can you think? 
Can you formulate a, can you formulate a concept around the problem? Can you apply yourself with a, in a procedural manner towards solving that problem? And do you have the commitment, the internal integrity, the honesty to yourself to Excellent. solve this problem Excellent. and stay with it? If you have that, I will Excellent. give you a job tomorrow. Thank you. But if you come to me with MSc from some university, commerce communication, as far as I'm concerned, forget it. So when I mean education, young man, I'm saying you should spend your time personal development, evaluating who you are, and then secondly, closing any gaps that you can identify. If you don't have those things, then it's going to be a challenge, unfortunately, for, for many of us. That is Chine Mbaozoku. I'm going to give the lady in the house just one minute to tie it up, and then I'll wrap up this session, and we'll run. I'd like, uh, I like to say that what we need, we have, and that is resilience. I have not seen any other country on the face of the earth. At least I was in secondary school in 1993. I saw how people ran for their lives for democracy, and we still have a country. We, still, we are still growing. I was ar around during the Abacha days, and I know how we suffered. And if we could come out of there, we will progress in this country. And what we have is sitting right here in this room. Wow. What we have is sitting right here in this room. I'll get a little cultural, and I'll go down to our level. Any village where people fall sick is good ground for the native doctor. Sam Adeyemi is my mentor and my role model. And he will tell you, if you want to be a leader, solve a problem. If you want to be a national leader, solve a national problem. Each time I see an audience like this, what I see is heads of state. And one day, some of you will address the General Assembly of the United Nations. Just dream it and believe. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a wonderful time being with you. A round of applause for my sister, Chidebere Okere. A round of applause for Dr. Ifredio <laughs> Rama Amobi. A round of applause for Chineyem Baozoko. And a big round of applause for our brother, Frank Wenke II. Let's rise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have done some networking, but it's time for me to hand over. Get some complimentary cards. Get to know the next person. They might be your next business breakthrough. Thank you very much.